Can you? Oh, great, amazing. Um, hi, hello again, we are ready to start to continue with our next talk. Um, I'm very happy and excited uh, uh, to introduce you Drew Gallatin, who is here uh, on the stage with me at the moment. Uh, Drew has been working for Netflix uh, for eight, eight years, maybe something like that, yes. And uh, his specialty is uh, free BSD kernel optimizations and he's been uh, committing to the FreeBSD free for more than 25 years. So let's uh, give uh, Drew a round of applauses and welcome him on the stage and let's hear more about the magical mystery merge. Hey, so I'm here to talk a little bit about, first about how we use FreeBSD at Netflix and then to talk about why we run FreeBSD Current, and to give a nice little case study, which I call the Magical Mystery Merge, which kind of exemplifies why it's good to run Current. So I work on um, our CDN, and a CDN is basically a content distribution network. A lot of companies use that to distribute, you know, operating system updates or video games or movies like to their customers all over the world. Uh, we call our CDN OpenConnect, and we call our CDN servers Open Connect appliances. Um, and we call them appliances mostly because, in a lot of ways, they're a little bit, they have a little bit more in common with like your home router than they do with the server at your office. And what I mean by that is we have like an A, B partition, and you know, we re image them every time we update them. So we image the B side, and then if that fails, it falls back to the A side. The software is completely identical on every single machine. There's no package in some machine that's not on other machines. This is an example of uh, one of our OCAs that can serve 400 gigabits a second. Uh, we currently have uh, three different types of OCAs. We have a all flash OCA, meaning all NVMe, or the older ones are all SATA SSDs. They serve the very most popular content, and those are mostly located in our uh, Data, in, our, in our data centers at internet inter, interchange points where the internet comes together. Uh, we also have storage OCAs, which hold you know, hundreds of terabytes of uh, video assets. And that, that could be you know, anything from a really unpopular title that you know, somebody only watches once a week to e even the very most popular things. And we also have what we call a global OCA, which is given to uh, smaller ISPs uh, to help them offload um, the traffic that's coming to their network. So, for example, if you're watching a movie, it's coming from inside your ISP's network, and their uplink isn't affected by that traffic. So, a little bit about the OCAs. Um, we run FreeBSD Current, and I'll get into why we run Current. And one of the most frequent questions I get asked is, do you run ZFS? And yes, we do run ZFS, but we only run it for root. We don't run it for um, our content partitions. And that's because ZFS has its own cache called the ARC, or the Adaptive Replacement Cache, which is separate from the kernel page cache, which means in order to serve anything out of ZFS, things need to be copied from the ARC to the page cache, which is inefficient. So we run UFS uh, for all of our content partitions. Uh, we run NGINX as our web server. And the other thing I wanted to mention about our file systems and stuff is that unlike a lot of CDNs, we just let drives fail in place. We don't run any RAID. There's no, re there's no redundancy except for the, the root partitions. Um, but for the content partitions, we just let drives fail in place. It's a lot easier to just let it fail in place than to try to get ISPs to replace a drive or to send technicians to, to data centers. And the machines are, they mostly have so much storage that they lose one or two drives, they're still very useful as they are. So our, our workload is basically serving static files. Um, everything is pre-encoded uh, uh, before it even hits our CDN. So we have, you know, if you're watching a video, um, there'll be a different codec for maybe what's on your phone versus what's on your smart TV versus what's on your computer and there'll be all the different bit rates. So like one, one particular TV show or movie could have dozens of different downloadables for it. Uh, and we do this because video quality is like of the utmost importance, and we spend a lot of time and effort on making each encoding as good as it can possibly be. 
And so the, the nice thing is that having everything static simplifies our workload since there's no compute involved on the CDN server. And so a little bit about FreeBSD. I think most people here are familiar with Linux. Um, FreeBSD got its start around the same time that Linux did, but in a much different way. Whereas Linux was written from scratch, FreeBSD uh, is directly descended from the BSDs that were the basis of you know, SunOS and, and things like that in the, in the 80s. Um, FreeBSD came out of 386 BSD, which was a port of the old, the old BSD to x86, you know, 386 boxes. That sort of, that 386 kind of fell into a little bit of disrepair, and there was a patch kit that was maintained, and there were two groups of people that, that were maintaining the patch kit that sort of forked. NetBSD came out at the same, roughly the same time. They focused on uh, compatibility and correctness and running on as many architectures as they could whereas FreeBSD focused on just performance on, at the time, x86 32-bit. Our first 64-bit uh, port was in the late 90s. That's how I actually got my start in, as a FreeBSD committer. I worked on that, on that port. Um, but FreeBSD likes to basically really support the current high-performance architectures. And so once uh, an architecture is sunsetted by the vendor, we sunset it as well. So the alpha port was the first port we ever retired because, you know, Alpha, sadly, Alpha died. Um, so FreeBSD is a little bit different than a Linux dist distro because in Linux, everything is packaged. In FreeBSD, we still have this legacy thing where we have the kernel and all of the basic utilities you know, like that you would expect on a shell, like the actual shell itself, like LS, move, copy, that kind of thing, the compilers. All that stuff is unpackaged and belongs in the root file system. And we also package, we also give, uh, we also believe in packaging third-party software. Things like uh, the Firefox web browser or the Nginx web server or, you know, things like that come, come in packages. And so when you install FreeBSD, you get all that plus all the source and the man pages and documentation. At Netflix, we have our own stripped-down distribution that we run on our uh, OCAs. And that, you know, obviously doesn't include compilers or documentation or most packages just because we don't need those things. And so the team I work on in, at Netflix is called the OCA dev team. And our responsibility is to maintain the software that uh, runs on the OCAs. Uh, most of us are FreeBSD committers or contributors. Um, there's roughly 10 of us. And uh, it's a great place to work and it's the best job I've ever had. So I want to talk a little bit about how we do FreeBSD uh, development at Netflix. When we first started off, we made the choice that everybody makes, which was to track a stable branch and to, to back up a little bit. The way FreeBSD works is, in some ways, it's, if you're familiar with Linux, it's similar to Linux. Um, there is what we call FreeBSD current, which in many ways is sim similar to like the Linux tree, uh, where everything goes in there first. Um, and then there are stable branches, which are what in Linux most people call long-term support or LTS branches. And so in FreeBSD, there's a new release. Supposedly every two years, it really works out in practice to be every three or four. And so every time there's a new release, a new long-term support or stable branch is created. And so what we used to do is we used to track um, the latest stable branch. And then every few weeks, we would merge all the security fixes and bug fixes that made it into the stable branch. And we would then, you know, make an internal release that would go out to our OCAs. And that worked really well for the period we were doing that. But what was terrible was when we moved from one stable branch to another. And that would take sometimes, in the best case, weeks. Most, most times it would take months, you know, up to six months because you could encounter a problem, uh, you know, either in code that we never managed to upstream uh, being compatible with the new interfaces in the new, in the new version, or there could be uh, some kind of regression introduced upstream in the new version that was hard to track down. And so these, these merges, every time we updated between stable branches, were just awful. And when we ran stable, it was also very hard for us to collaborate with upstream because the stable branches, you know, the APIs might be different. Like some function may take three arguments in stable and four arguments in current or something like that. And so if we wanted to contribute some change we made, we would first have to port it to current, then somehow test it because we weren't running, running current on our machines. 
and then submit it for review, get it accepted, and then it would finally be there when we went and moved to the next branch. And so there's very little motivation to do it, which meant we were keeping a lot of things back, which made each successive merge harder because we run into more and more conflicts the more and more stuff we had. So we could see that we were, we were kind of building up a technical debt by doing this. And so about five, six years ago, we, we decided what we were doing was silly and what we should do really is to uh, track FreeBSD current. And that sounds crazy on the face of it because that's where everybody pushes all their stuff. And unlike, unlike Linux, there's no subsystem maintainers. In FreeBSD, when you have a commit bit, you're allowed to commit, uh, you know, whatever you want. You're encouraged to get reviews, but it's, it's, you know, it's treated with freedom and responsibility. But at any rate, current is sometimes somewhat unstable. And so running current sounds crazy, but it's actually the best thing in the world. Because when we run current, we do the same every three, four weeks uh, merge cycle where we pull in the stuff from upstream. And when we do that, um, we catch things really fast. If there's some regression, we catch it right away. Uh, there's no you know, two, three year delay between somebody committing something and us finding it's a problem. And it also allows us to upstream things much more quickly because we no longer have to port it to basically a different version of the operating system. So it allows us to co collaborate with upstream developers and get our changes in to FreeBSD quickly. And over the years, the amount of things we've held back has decreased and decreased and decreased. So speaking of up upstreaming code to FreeBSD, basically, since we run current, our tree is almost identical to the up upstream FreeBSD tree. And so if we want to make a small feature or if we want to make a small bug fix, what we often do is rather than doing it in our tree, we actually do it in the actual FreeBSD tree itself, get it reviewed and committed, and then that will just naturally come back in our every three week merge cycle. Uh, so that greatly reduces the amount of technical debt we accumulate by keeping our own patches. Um, and if there's something critical, like a security fix or a bug fix for you know a crashing issue or something, we'll cherry pick it immediately, and rather than waiting for the merge cycle. But for larger changes, like when we did kernel TLS, that was a very large, very invasive change, and so we kept that to ourselves for close to five years, uh, not because we were trying to be secret or proprietary, but just because we wanted to get it in the form that it actually needed to be in to be useful upstream and not just to us. So we do testing. Uh, you know, every time we push to a branch, uh, Jenkins' job it gets gets kicked off. Uh, it, at Netflix, we run on both AMD 64, which Microsoft also calls it AMD 64. Everybody else calls it x86 64, and ARM 64. And so we run a, a, a small regression suite on that. And then every night, or close to every night, we run uh, what we call a smoke test, where we run with all debugging enabled on the kernels, meaning like memory corruption checking, use after free checking, uh, you know, lock reversal, lock, lock ordering checking, all the, all the checking we can check is running uh, close to every night on a small cluster of machines looking for any bugs that we've introduced. And then when we do, when we do release testing, we run it on a slightly wider set of machines at, uh, you know, with all the, all the bug checks off, just looking for any performance differences or any other regressions that we can find. So we've contributed a lot to FreeBSD over the years, which I'm very proud of. Probably the most important, like most fundamental thing we've, we've contributed is something we call async send file. That was done by my colleague Gleb Shmanoff um, in collaboration with Nginx. And the, the gist of that is that when, Send file is a system call, which basically says, if you have a file here and a socket there, like you don't have to read from the file into user space and then push things back into the kernel. It tells the kernel, take data from this file and put it on this socket. And the problem with send file in most operating systems is that it blocks, because you have to wait for the stuff to come in from disk. And so asynchronous send file basically allows the web server to just say, do this send file, and then return immediately and then the operating system in the background brings the data in, and then the, the interrupt completion handler from the, for the disk drive then pushes things out to the network. And that allows us to avoid having thread pools or using async I.O. or doing any, any, any sort of thing like that. And that's, that one thing has, is the fundamental optimization that's enabled everything else. Um, something else we do 
is what we call un unmapped MBUFs, and that was done to prepare for kernel TLS. Basically, it's MBUFs are the fundamental uh, network uh, buffer in FreeBSD, and unmapped MBUFs essentially use, it's very much like a Linux SKB frag structure, where rather than pointing to one data object, they can point to many data objects. And so one single MBUF can carry an entire TLS record with, you know, four 4K pages or five 4K pages and header and uh, TLS signature information. And that is just by itself, even without TLS, is a big optimization because it saves a lot of cache misses when you're point doing pointer chasing and things like socket buffers. Uh, there's kernel TLS, uh, which basically moves bulk data encryption from OpenSSL in user space to the kernel. And the reason that that's valu valuable is it, again, avoids lot doing lots of boundary crossing because without kernel TLS, you need to read data from the file into your user space application, do the crypto, then push it back into the kernel. This allows you to avoid that detour, do the crypto in the kernel, and have things go right out. And even better, if you have a network card like a Mellanox ConnectX uh, 6 DX or, or newer or a Chelsea OT6, then you can do kernel TLS, um, actually NIC TLS offload, which lets the NIC do itself do the encryption. Which, so it makes it essentially from the kernel's perspective like there's no crypto at all. Stuff just comes in from, the, in from storage, goes out on the network, kernel never even touches the memory. That's why the MBUFs are unmapped. We've also con contributed something we call the CAM IO scheduler. Uh, CAM is the FreeBSD acronym for the, its storage system. And the idea behind that is that we like to uh, be able to fill from other OCAs content that's needed on a, at a particular site at the same time we're serving traffic. And we found that a lot of storage devices, if you're doing a lot of writes, uh, the read performance suffers. And so CAM, uh, the I.O. scheduler, uh, sort of mitigates the speed at which writes happen or reads happen in order to uh, keep everything nice and smooth. Uh, we've contributed the rack and BBR TCP stacks. You may have heard of BBR. It's the, it was done by Google uh, initially in Linux and ported to FreeBSD by my colleague Randall Stewart. Uh, it's also the congestion control algorithm that's used in Quick. Um, we actually don't use it much. Uh, we used something called Rack, which is similar in spirit, and that was completely written uh, at Netflix by Randall Stewart. Uh, we've also contributed the TCP pacing system, uh, HPTS, um, and the point of that is that if we wanted to send data as fast as possible, I could send data at 100 gigabits a second to your cable modem in you know, a 64K or 128K chunk, and your cable modem's buffer might only be 32K long, and so you would drop most of it, and we would end up having lots of TCP retransmits because we'd just be shoving data at you, and, you'd, and it would be dropped all the time. So the pacing system basically allows us to, uh, again, deliver data more smoothly and avoid uh, packet loss. Uh, we've given, we've also contributed some performance enhancements for NUMA. I've given a lecture about that. You can find it on my page at FreeBSD.org. Uh, we contributed something called PFL memory pointer hooks, which to be honest was inspired by Linux's XDP. And the idea behind that is that if we're under a, a denial of service attack and we need to drop a lot of traffic, we want to do it as efficiently as possible. And what this does is this allows the, uh, this allows the, the firewall to basically get a pointer from the device driver to the packet that was just received. And the firewall can essentially say, you know, hey, that's good, go, go the normal way, or drop it immediately. And, in, and by doing that, the network driver can simply recycle that buffer pretty much for free. Whereas if we went through the normal path to the firewall, the driver would have to, you know, allocate a new buffer, map it for DMA, the fire, uh, unmap, the old, unmap the old buffer for DMA, pass the buffer up the chain, of the network stack where everybody's looking at it and taking cache misses. And then finally, the, with the firewall said, no, we can't have this packet, then the firewall would have to free the packet. And so with this, we can drop tens of millions of packets per second and still serve without any impact to our serving. Uh, we've done many, too many scalability fixes uh, to, to mention, probably more than I can remember. And most recently, uh, my colleague Warner Losh did this thing called Kboot, which started off on PowerPC 64 to ARM, and, to ARM 64 and AMD 64. And it's a way to run FreeBSD directly from Linux. So when, you know, in Linux, you can k-exec another Linux kernel, or some Linuxes use it to, to do crash dumps. Well, we, we use this to boot on uh, systems that use Linux, Linux BIOS, where there's no UEFI. So we can k-exec directly from, from Linux into FreeBSD. Oops. 
So, whoops. So, um, we also uh, contribute in other ways than code. We have great relationships with a lot of hardware vendors. Like people really like us and they want to sell us stuff. And so if somebody comes to us with a product that we're really interested in that only has a Linux driver or only has a Windows driver, you know, we we collaborate with them and help them to, you know, find resources to port their driver to FreeBSD and to upstream it. And there's, I mean, I, I can't mention which, but there's a lot of drivers in FreeBSD that wouldn't exist if it wasn't for this. And we also, uh, Netflix as a company and also us personally, most of us contribute to the FreeBSD Foundation. So my job is to improve performance. Um, but it's not, I can't just improve performance because the easiest thing I could do to improve performance would be to get rid of Rack TCP and to get rid of the TCP pacing system. But that would make our members' quality of experience terrible. It, one of the things we really pride ourselves on at Netflix is reducing the number of times you see the little spinny wheel where things are rebuffering. And so like if I got rid of the TCP pacing, well, CPU use would go way down, but our members would see a lot more of the little spinny wheels for rebuffering. And so it's not, a, it, so I, it, it's, a, it's a fine line to walk on, on how we can improve performance. But my goal is basically to improve bandwidth uh, for, on the same hardware and to also re reduce power consumption by being able to deliver the same amount of traffic with a smaller machine. And here are some things that I'm particularly proud of. Um, in 2017, we had the first, what I believe is the first 100 gigabit per second like production CDN server in the world. And that was due to kernel TLS. Um, in 2020, we had the first uh, 200 gigabit per second uh, CDN server. That's an AMD Rome based system. And it was more like 240 gigabits. Um, in 2021, those, that same hardware is, was now, now became capable of doing 400 gigabits because we, were, we enabled um, the NIC TLS offload. So we moved the crypto from the kernel down to the NIC. Uh, and there was some soft, we had those machines deployed for a while and there was some software support that needed to be done before we could actually enable that in the fleet. And 20, 2022, we did the first 800 gigabit uh, a second CDN server, which is basically a, very similar to the first one, except it's a dual, so uh, the previous one, except it's a dual socket system with twice as many NICs and twice as much storage. And the thing that I'm particularly proud of, which isn't quite there yet, but I included in the presentation because I'm so excited about it, is that we should have the first server that can do 100 gigabits a second uh, for less than 100 watts. Meaning that, you, you, know, uh, you know, for the power that you used to have for a light bulb, you can serve 20, 30,000 customers video. Um, and that's based on an NVIDIA uh, Bluefield DPU. And this is basically a 100 gig NIC that has 16 ARM cores on it. And you know, a, a, I think something like 48 gigs of, of a DDR5 memory. And it, the cool thing is it doesn't need a host. You plug it into a PCI expansion chassis, plug in some NVMe, and you have a system that uses very little power that, is, that can serve a, a lot of traffic. And it's not quite there yet because the prototype we have in the lab is using a 1200 watt power supply and we're getting about, we're measuring at the wall, we're getting about 125 watts and we're, we ordered a power supply that's smaller because if, if you have a power supply that's 1200 watts and you're only pulling 100 watts, the efficiency is terrible. And it also has more NVMe drives than it needs because I'm lazy and I want to ramp machines up quickly and the more the more storage I have, the more clients will come and find stuff that they want, so the more traffic I get quickly. And so once, once I pull a couple of NVMe drives and move to a better power supply, I'm hoping it'll drop from 125 watts to below 100. All right, now here's the, the title of the talk, and this is, this is basically why we run uh, FreeBSD Current. So we did an upstream merge in August, and it was a and as things start out, it was a very easy merge, like almost no, like only two merge conflicts. Everything looked great. And then I went to test it on my original 100 gig machine, which I test every merge there for performance. And I noticed that the performance, in, the, the CPU use increased by roughly 20%. And I did, you know, everything that I normally do when I'm looking for performance problems. I looked to see, you know, if there was some function that was super hot, maybe there's lock contention. And I spent, a, you know, a long time looking over profilers and I just couldn't figure out why the CPU use, the CPU use had gotten so high. 
So this is a, an internal uh, graph of ours that shows like the bandwidth being served. That's roughly uh, 92 gigs, which is what we serve on our 100, on our 100 gig machines. And this is what the uh, this is what the CPU use should look like in the in the low 40 percent range. And this is what it looks like after the merge, like kind of jagged and janky and like 50 percent or, or or above. And so when you don't know what you're doing and you have no idea what happened, what you do is you bisect. Um, and I. Not sure how many people here are developers. Has anybody here ever done a git bisect? Want to raise your hand? All right, so I'll, I'll try to explain it then. So basically, a git bisect, you take the last point you knew everything was good, and then you take where you are where it's bad, and, and you check out a tree that's halfway in between. And if that tree is good, then you know that everything before it was good. And so you check out a tree halfway in between the bad point and, and the good point, and you just keep narrowing things down like that until you figure out which commit is the problem. And since we run, uh, we run FreeBSD in a subtree sub of our entire tree, it, it was kind of painful because I did the bisect upstream, looked at the git hash, and then did the, did the merge on that git hash in the subtree, and you know, redid the merge conflicts over and over and again, which was really boring. Um, so the process was basically to do that, build an image, uh, and you know, install it and test it. And that whole process uh, took about four hours per bisection step. And it was quite slow and painful. And as SpongeBob would say, like one eternity later, um, we found I found the commit. And of course, it still didn't make any sense. Usually, when when you do this, you look at the commit and you're like, oh, and now I understand what happened. In this case, it still made absolutely no sense. This, and the funny thing is, this is like the most famous FreeBSD commit that I can remember. Um, there was, there's a guy, Colin Percival, who's a FreeBSD committer. He also runs Tarsnap, if you've ever heard of that. It's a backup service. And he, likes, he, he runs it in AWS, and he wants to be able to boot AWS instances as quick as possible. So he's been working on optimizing this, this, the boot speed of FreeBSD. And he discovered that there's this sorting routine that runs when FreeBSD boots that was using what he said was a bubble sort, which is a you know, horribly inefficient sort. And FreeBSD spent a lot of its time booting just running this sort, and he fixed that. And the commit that broke everything for us is, is that commit where he fixed the sorting time. So you can see, like that's a fairly popular tweet, at least for something related to FreeBSD. He was on the, on the front page of Hacker News for a while. And so, to detour into what's a, into what's a sys in it. So basically, like every kernel subsystem needs to initialize itself at boot, um, and and that's done using the sys init macro. Um, and the the linker when you build the kernel sorts every sys in it into this alphabetically ordered list. And, but you don't really want it in alphabetical order. You want it in the order that you need to initialize the subsystems in. So that's, that's where the sort comes in. There's 79 subsystems, and within the, each of those subsystems, there's something like eight different levels. Like, you know, I want to go first. I want to go second. I, you know, I want to go last. Or I don't really care where I want to go. And so they're sorted at boot by first subsystems, and the subsystems have an order that they're initialized in. And then within those subsystems, that order, those ordering hints are applied. And so the key is that the sysinets with the same, that, that are tied, that have the same subsystem and have the same ordering hint, they should be able to run in any order. So, but it turns out the original sort uh, wasn't a bubble sort, it was a selection sort. And that meant that ties were handled differently. And so we went from having everything still in alphabetical order within, all the ties were kept in alphabetical order, to having all the ties in reverse alphabetical order. And, uh, I, and Colin and I both verified that independently using this thing he made called TS log, which logs like what's running at boot and how long it takes. Um, and so the easy fix uh, for this was to reverse, his, reverse the order that his new sort was using. And once we did that, everything worked, but it still made no sense. Like, why did that matter? Um, and so, Excuse me, a very dry mouth. Um, and so basically, I wanted to figure out why it mattered. So I hacked the kernel to control the order that things were sorted in. And so first I, I 
reversed entire subsystems, and I did another bisection where I took the first half of the subsystems and this, uh, er, you know, and then you know, reversed them and saw if that worked, and then and did a bisection that way, and then once I found the the subsystem that was at fault, which was the driver subsystem, I then bisected, you know, all the things in that, just, you know, essentially, you know, and then a second bisection. And that took a long time too. It was faster because I didn't need to recompile and re-image anything because I could just use, boot, you know, boot arguments to do it. But eventually I figured out what the real problem was. And so essentially there were multiple uh, CPU frequency control drivers that thought that they wanted to attach to the CPU frequency control hardware on our uh, on our Intel Xeons. And this happened because the way drivers are supposed to work in FreeBSD is they're supposed to be a probe score. So every driver kind of gets to look and say, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I know what that hardware is, and that's exactly what, I'm, what I was made for, and I want that 100%. Or, you know, I think maybe I can handle this hardware, but I'm not sure, and if somebody else, you know, better comes along, you should give it to them. Unfortunately, these drivers weren't doing that, and they were either returning like a, like a one or a zero, saying, yeah, I can, I, can, I can handle it, or no, I can't. And both of these drivers were saying, yeah, I can handle it. And so when that happens, the first guy to get there wins. And so that meant that uh, when the order was, was in the alphabetical order, the newer, more modern Intel EST driver attached first, and the older Pentium 4 thermal control something or other driver attached second and, and got there and, and, and lost because it was second. When the order was reversed, the older, much worse driver attached first, and the newer appropriate driver got there and found somebody else was there and didn't attach. Um, so things had work, worked accidentally for you know, years, close to a decade, I think, just because of that alphabetical ordering. Uh, my colleague, Warner Losh, is actually working to add appropriate probe scoring to all these drivers so that, uh, that you know, the ties will be broken appropriately. So, and I was kicking myself because FreeBSD has a sys control node which tells you the frequencies that are supported and stuff. And when the P4TCC driver attached, uh, you saw basically garbage. There were frequencies that weren't supported by the processor, and that number behind the slash is like how much power it thinks it's supposed to use, which meant that it had no idea. Whereas the EST driver, it saw all the actual frequencies and it knew all the actual power uh, consumption levels for the different frequencies, and it was just, it was correct. And so what was happening was basically the CPU was just running at a, at a slower speed than it should have been running at. And so everything was fine. There was no actual like regression because something got worse in terms of things actually getting less efficient. It's just that the kernel was running this, the processor at a slower speed without even realizing it. And so this is like, you know, an example of um, community interaction. This is a... This is a, basically an example of like great community interaction. I reached out to Colin after I figured out that that commit was the problem uh, on an internal uh, FreeBSD IRC chat room. And within you know, minutes, he responded. And we both independently verified that the sorting order was different. Um, and th the key thing is that he remembered the change because he had just done it a few weeks ago. He remembered the change and he was super happy to help. Um, and he posted a fix for review that same day. It landed in FreeBSD current the next day, and I cherry picked it down into our merge branch, you know, within a few minutes of it landing. Um, so our benefit, the benefits to us is, uh, sorry, the benefits to, to the community, rather, is that we noticed this bug almost immediately because uh, we run a lot of server class hardware. Other people might see some kind of problem like this and might just say, oh, the new version of FreeBSD is slower. I don't know why. Um, but we were the first to notice the regression, and we were the first to be able to attribute it to this change. And later we realized that there was one other bug that popped up around the same time. Uh, There's some kind of kernel crash in an AMD temperature driver that was due to the same issue. Um, and our, the benefit to us, to Netflix from this, is that this was a crazy bug that required bisection. Um, bisecting like three weeks of changes was terrible because each bisection tech step takes like four hours. And so, I, you know, bisection, it's like, a, you know, kind of a log, log, log type thing where 
know, if you have twice as many changes, it's only one more bisection step. But it, I'm talking, if we're talking three years worth of changes, I can't imagine even doing that bisection. It would have driven, driven me insane. Um, and the other benefit to us is that since we found it so quickly, Colin was like very responsive um, and it got fixed almost immediately. If this had been a change that had been in FreeBSD for three years, it would have been perfectly reasonable for him to say, what, you gotta be crazy. This has been in the tree for three years. Nobody's complained about it. Like, you guys have gotta be doing something wrong and be in denial. I mean, and that's nothing to say about him. He, maybe he wouldn't, he's a great guy. But if it was one of my changes, I would definitely be like, what are you talking about? I did that change three years ago. I barely even remember why I did it. Like, why are you talking to me about it now? Like, it's been, nobody's complained about it. Obviously, you're doing something wrong. Just go away. And that would be a very easy thing for somebody to say after, after three years. And so that's basically uh, all I really had to talk about. Uh, and it looks like we have about 10 minutes for questions, if anybody has any. No. No questions? Okay, you can go to the mic, please. How much time it takes to upgrade all your servers? How much time does it take to upgrade all, all of our servers? Um, so essentially the servers are upgraded in waves. Uh, we don't do them all at once because there could be some bug that we didn't catch in testing. So I think that, I don't, I don't do the upgrade of all of our servers. Our fleet is on the order of tens of thousands of machines. We have an operations team that does that. I believe it takes roughly, roughly a week, I think, but don't quote me on that, because I'm not, I'm not certain. Um, in fact, one of the worst bugs we ever had was due to a bug in a network interface driver. We took new firmware for the, net, a new firmware block for the network interface driver. And we do a lot of monitoring of temperature, of, of uh, opt optical transceivers, of light levels, of everything. And we, we slam the I to C interface that's on those transceivers. And there was a bug in their firmware where like in one in a million, one in 10 million I to C reads would time out and cause the NIC to reset and just basically go dead. Uh, and so this was like five or six years ago, we started rolling a firmware out and we noticed that you know, maybe one in a thousand machines was not responsive after, you know, a day or so. And that was, and that was like the worst, that was the worst bug that we ever had because when a machine's not responsive, it's really hard to deal with, especially if it's at a, if it's at a site where we don't have um, IPMI access to it. So we have IPMI access to everything that we have in an internet interchange point, but not, uh, we don't have IPMI access to things that are in ISP data centers. And so thankfully we found that before we hit any ISP data centers so we could actually reboot the machines. But since then we've been much more careful about taking firmware blobs. In fact, we actually have our own copy of uh, some of the firmware that we know works and just ignore the upstream firmware commits. And after you fixed the driver sorting bug, did the performance improve or it was like before the update? It was, yeah, it, the performance was as we expected. It was, it was the original performance in the, in the mid-low 40% range that we expected. Uh, why a free BSD and not a Linux or some, some other distribution? Um, that's a question that is likely to start a flame war. So it's a question of, that my management has told me not to get into. Um, but we're not stupid and we wouldn't, run, we, we wouldn't be running FreeBSD if it didn't work better in this application for us. Like we're not religious. At least I'm not religious. I've, in my past, I've worked on Linux. I worked uh, on Linux uh, for a company that I, made, that I worked on Unix device drivers for Linux and Solaris and FreeBSD and macOS and ESX, VMware and all kinds of crazy operating systems. And I worked on Linux when I worked at Google, so I'm, I'm not religious. It's just, it, right now, it's just, it just seems like it's the best tool for the job. I think the, the initial decision may have been made based on the license. I wasn't there, so I don't know. Anything else? Uh, 
Um, Drew, thank you very much for sharing bits of your really challenging work with us. It was really interesting. Uh, we have prepared something for you. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, let's give him another round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you.